His name is Dr. John Pilkey, and I want to welcome you to the Voice of Reason. How are you doing? Just fine. You know, you have done some rather extensive work on post diluvian world. And it was fun uh, having an opportunity to speak with you the other day and uh, ask you to be on the broadcast. Uh, there are a lot of people out there that have a lot of very strange beliefs, but the thing that I found interesting with your work is you point out that, uh, and you prove through the Bible, that yes, all races did come from Adam. Yes, that's certainly the case. Uh, the races are, in my opinion, built into the original creation. They were deliberate. They were a plenitude. They were part of the plan. And they originated in the family of Adam. Languages also arose before the flood. And the history of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 has been misinterpreted from the days of Augustine forward on the basis that linguistic unity at the time that the tower was built was, uh, had existed from the days of Adam. That's not true. Linguistic unity... In the, in the time that the Tower of Babel was built, was uh, the sin under judgment in the text. It's not for building a city. There were a number of cities that were being built in Mesopotamia at that time. It was not for building a tower temple. It was for linguistic unity because uh, one of the sons of Noah, Ham, was attempting to reduce the entire world to a single linguistic stock by teaching Hamitic, that is Egyptian, as a lingua franca. And this was contrary to the diversity principle favored by his political adversaries, Noah and Shem, who favored diversity. And God's intervention restored that diversity principle. So languages and races were there from the start. They were part of the plan from the start. They had theological, theocratic value and meaning, uh, the languages at least. And therefore, it's a somewhat different picture from the one that has been adopted by others, uh, under the assumption that man was strictly unified in race and language before Babel. Dr. John Pilkey is my guest in this hour, and I went against my own uh, normal uh, deal in the, in the beginning uh, for a first-time guest. Give a little background. And, John, uh, if you would, uh, please give people a little bit of your background. Uh, you were a seminary professor when I first heard about you, and I understand you've retired now. Yes, I was an English professor at a Christian college on the West Coast of the Master's College. Uh, John MacArthur's president. College. What? John MacArthur's College. Yes, John MacArthur's College, that's correct. I had been uh, in the field of English throughout my professional career, and uh, I went to the West Coast in 1975 when the college was known as Los Angeles Baptist College. But the project that I'm discussing here dates back much earlier than that. It dates back 1963, when I was in, still an undergraduate at Tufts University. Uh, and I began with two discoveries at that time. If you wish me to detail those discoveries at any time during this session, I'd be happy to do so. They were, one of them launched the project, and the other one uh, got me off in the right direction in terms of interpreting early post diluvian history. There are works uh, that you have used uh, that date back in that area, I believe, to yes. kind of bring your own uh, thought processes forward. Go ahead and get into that, if you would. Well, there are a number of sources for the project. One is uh, simply the existence of ethnic groups throughout the world. Um, another one is the Sumerian King List. This is a very important document that uh, contains approximately 20 dynasties, each filled with kings, and kingship is the central theme of the age. Uh, because Noah's family were not simply survivors. They were builders, and they were rulers, and they uh, built nations with their eyes open and had great privilege and great power, uh, very extraordinary. So the Sumerian king list is, is important. It, another uh, source of importance in the Sumerian culture is their series of epics on a certain war fought between the uh, regime at Uruk in Sumer against the city-state known as Arata in Iran. This was extremely important because the two, at that time, you were early enough that the world population was still pretty low. And what you had in these two uh, parts of the earth was two halves of the world. A schism had taken place, uh, led by a figure named Peleg in Genesis 10. He's known as Kingu in the Marduk epic, and there are three or four Sumerian epics detailing that event, that war, and that war was extreme, and also uh, the, the Marduk epic of the uh, Semites in uh, central Mesopotamia also have their version 
which is in that epic, which is well known. Uh, that war was extremely important because the losers in the war, the people who were located in Iran, were exiled in punishment for having lost and for having been schismatic. And as a result, they were exiled to the ends of the earth and became, because of their isolation, their great distance from the centers of civilization, they became um, what we call the third world. The word primitivism and natives and tribes and all that language has been applied to uh, the descendants of the losers at, uh, at Arata. And a large fraction of the world's population uh, descends from those losers. So the uruk arata War is extremely important. There are three Sumerian texts that deal with it, that present it, that narrate it, and at least three. And there's one great Akkadian Semitic text that does likewise. In fact, the uruk arata War is the most important post-Diluvian event not recorded in the Bible. The Bible records the flood, the sin of Ham, and the Tower of Babel. The uruk arata War occurred subsequently, and the Bible passes it over in silence but it's essential to understanding early post-Diluvian history. The, um, the main goal was simply to build a plenitude of nations. There were eight survivors of the flood, four males and four females. Each one, each one was accorded high privilege, taking responsibility for a linguistic stock. Those linguistic stocks are kind of super nations because they involve, they, they cover large uh, spheres of the earth, the Indo-European stock, uh, presently inhabits the region running all the way from Ireland in the northwest to Sri Lanka in the southeast. Another great stock is the Austronesian, who begin with the, off the coast of Africa at Malagasy and extend across Malaysia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. And they're all just one unit in the Noahic scheme. They happen to be, the Austronesians happen to be the, the, the stock that was... Uh, that was granted to Kali, the black matriarch. The East Indians accurately name her. They, they name her. She's black, and they call her Kali. And she was the one responsible for the Austronesians. Shem was the one originally responsible for the Indo-Europeans. Ham was the one originally responsible for the Semites, and that leads to confusion because uh, the Semites take the name of Shem, and that's all because of an upheaval caused by the sin of Ham and Noah's reaction against it. So it's a complex history, but the main thing was that they were building deliberately building uh, linguistic stocks. And they also, the eight survivors of the flood, claimed eight particular regions, lands, that each one of them claimed as his or her own in and around Mesopotamia. And those eight turn up in a particular document of the Sumerians, uh, an inscription by the emperor Lugalalamundu, who claims to have reigned over eight regions. Those eight regions date back to the earliest times of Noah and to his family, and they were assigned to his uh, these eight members of the of the company that survived the flood. So it was a matter of building nations with in the most deliberate conceivable way. But the sin of Ham was a homosexuality. Uh, now, aside from that, this sin is not only narrated in Genesis nine, but it turns up in the first seventy seven lines of the Marduk epic of the Akkadians. The climax of that epic is the uruk arata War, but the premise behind it is a conflict between the family of Ham and Noah and his son Shem. They paired off in two factions, and those factions continued as a kind of two-party system for the rest of history, down to the death of Shem. Uh, the, the, uh, the story uh, in the uh, Marduk epic is that the Noah figure named Apsu is enraged at, a, at one of his sons and a certain body of uh, persons called, called the gods. They're the family of Ham. Now, the, the text does not specify what the sin was. All it says is that the Noah figure was so outraged against them that he couldn't sleep at night, and he wanted to kill them off. And his wife, named Tiamat in the text, persuades him not to kill them off. And as a result, uh, <laughs> Noah loses power. And uh, as a matter of fact, that is... Uh, he let Ham continue to live, and the Hamites continue to live, which they had to because they were, they were a fraction of the world's population already. And uh, the result was that the Hamites got the better of, of, of Noah at a certain point in history and really deposed him. So it was a, a, a tragedy. Uh, the sin of Ham is a, is a tragedy all around. However, there was an important event that occurred then. In Genesis 9:26. Shem, uh, Noah not only curses Canaan, the heir of Ham, but he blesses the Yahweh Elohim of Shem. And that has a special meaning because it's a dual name of God. 
uh, Yahweh and, uh, and Elohim. It's well known that the early Genesis, there are two creation accounts, one referring to God as Elohim, the other one referring to God as Yahweh. Those languages, those, excuse me, those names of God correlated with linguistic stocks. The Semites were the people of Elohim, and Shem's original people, the Indo-Europeans, were the people of Yahweh. What happened was that Noah stripped the Semitic stock from Ham, said you can't represent that anymore because you're immoral, and I, I, I will not allow you to represent that original stock. I'm giving that stock to, to Shem, and so for a time, Shem possessed as his own two stocks, both the Indo-Europeans and the Semites. And that le leads to confusion because of the kind of musical chairs in which the people originally created by Japheth, the Hamites, or became, were named Hamites, became Egyptians. The real father, the physical progenitor of the, uh, of the people of Egypt, who were uh, Caucasoid, they were white and they had broad shoulders, they took after their father, Japheth. But Japheth lost that uh, linguistic stock to compensate Ham for having lost the Semites to Shem. It's a complicated picture, but it's a, a very vivid and intense one. It is a fascinating subject. There are those I know that you uh, are familiar with that believe that uh, all races really didn't come from Adam. But when you bring these things forward, uh, one of the things that I came to realize, and we're coming up on our next break, but it became very apparent to me that if every living thing was killed except what God told Noah to bring on the ark, yes. including uh, those eight souls, then everything started again yes, with it them. Yes, it did. Yeah, that's the key. Everything begins again, and it begins on a new basis, a radically new basis, the formation of great governments and nations and civilizations. These did not exist. There was a certain degree of civilization before the flood but not like what occurred later. And therefore, it was not only a second beginning, it was the beginning of the world that we still inhabit historically. That is, this is the beginning of the Gentiles and their world order, and we still have to do with that order, meaning that Noah brought into existence the, the, the uh, social, uh, political order known as Gentiles. Uh, Christians are distinct from Gentiles, but the Gentiles are still there, and they are the result of... Uh, uh, Noah's work and the work of his family after the flood. The Bible is very selective. It's divinely selective. It, in other words, what is selected is for the edification of the entire human race, unfolding a plan of salvation. But that does not mean that you're absolutely comprehensively historical. It's not a, it is historical, but it's not the whole picture of history. It gives the logic underlying history. It's authoritative in that sense, and I've subordinated my mind to the Bible in working this out, but I work with all kinds of non-biblical data. I have to. It's a, there's a vast amount. You see, strictly speaking, Noah was not a biblical character as other characters. He was not a Hebrew. I mean, he lived long before, uh, I mean, he was not a, uh, an Israelite. He lived long before the time of Israel, and he was really the father of the Gentiles. That means that the Chinese, the Amerindians, the... Uh, black Africans, the Egyptians, all these people, the Indo-Europeans, they all have their own versions of Noah. Uh, it's, you know, it's been noised abroad that there are a number of flood traditions. Well, they're, they're uh, minimal compared to the fact that these persons who built the nations were remembered by the nations, and they all have their own versions. Now, what you get in the Bible is a West Semitic tradition carried down to Moses, possibly with the aid of the Egyptians, because he was learned in all the lore of the Egyptians, but the point is that uh, this is the West Semitic angle on what happened. It is very sober compared to the mythological form that many of these other traditions are. But all of the nations have their own angle on Noah. And uh, the, the, that's only, that's, that name is not comprehensive. Each one of these survives of the flood and their offspring have multiple names because they, uh, they, we see multiple names in the Bible. Jacob is also known as Israel. And Abram becomes Abraham. Uh, and the fact is that the variety of nations from which these people came means that they have a variety of different names. The names are of two types. One is the cognate type, in which you have a, a match between the sounds of the names, in other words, it's the same name simply altered somewhat in a new culture. And then you have all sorts of non-cognate names. For example, the Finns, the Finnish tradition, uh, remembers Noah under the name Uku, 
Well, that, that name is a cognate with Sumerian, Ukush, uh, the name of Noah as a ruler at one point, but it certainly isn't cognate with the name Noah. Okay, let's go to Ross up in Washington State. Wa- Ross, you're live and on the air. Welcome to the Voice of Reason. How you doing? I have a question. It's a kind of a compound question. Um, you know, when people are reading the Bible in Genesis 10 and the lists of the uh, figures in, in, in that chapter, in the following chapter, I think, and, you know, if they're in the literature and they're reading myths and legends and stuff, uh, say, for instance, uh, the uh, um, Gentiles' uh, versions of, you know, their Genesis list of patriarch gods, pantheons. How does a person identify and correlate these who is who in these pantheons with the Hebrew names in the, in the Table of Nations, uh, people, uh, patriarchs? Uh, any uh, Any list of interpretive keys one can keep in mind when reading such material? Uh, as the Sumerian king list, the Hindu Vedas, uh, because, you know, from uh, uh, some simple readings, like in the Greek, you, you notice there's this Daluklian figure in his flood, and in the Hindus, they talk about this Manu figure who had a boat and a flood coming, and he actually tied it to a mountaintop. And you had you have stuff like Poseidon uh, Yes, giving some kind of offspring to the Sidonians, which it kind of sounds like the root to that is Sidon or Sidon, and that's one of the figures in the Genesis list. Can you comment, uh, can it put this together? <laughs> yes, what you have to do to start with is to understand that the Noahic communities, of the family of Noah, so, uh, swelled during the lifetime of Shem to millions. However, the leaders of the early post-Diluvian world were this agree, uh, elite company of really only 54 persons. There are 77 names in Genesis 10, but sometimes they appear more than once, and it's a very, very elite group who do not expand because they had the highest longevities, they had the highest genetic privileges, and therefore they had the highest political privileges. So what you do is you keep that as kind of a target of only 54 persons, and you said when you read the uh, mythological pantheons of the other nations and, and you, you search them for evidences that they're of the highest antiquity, if they are, you know that there's going to be matches that will occur. As I've said before, some of the matches are cognate. The names actually resemble. In other cases, the names are not cognate, or they're cognate with something you wouldn't have thought of at first. But the point is that to keep this all straight, you have to keep in mind that you're dealing with a small community, a very small community. Now, when you have the king lists of the East Indians running off to the you know, 18th and 19th generation, very few of those names are going to have any reference to Noah's family. But when you're dealing with the Sumerians and their high pantheon, that's a different matter because you're going to have uh, the Sumerians aware of the small size of this community, and they're going to reflect the small size of this community in the formation of their pantheon. So you just have to keep that focus on a very small body of people. And to do so, keep in mind a symbol, the pyramid. The pyramid in Egypt represents has a tiny point at the top, or at least a very small area at top, and then it expands to the base. Now that is a picture of how the nations originated. From a small elite company, they were built from the top down, and the top was small, compact. So as long as you keep a compact uh, group in your mind, then you can study, carefully study, the different ethnic traditions to find out whether they have high enough antiquity to actually reach back into this elite group. What well, could you uh, could you maybe comment on the uh, uh, Poseidon uh, and the Sidonians, for instance, and where uh, where this this might derive from uh, relative to the uh, Genesis ten. Uh, Figure. Well, yes, yeah, Sidon is the firstborn, or Sidon is the firstborn of Canaan. Uh, he had two sons, Sidon and, uh, and Heth, and then the others really are vassals. Throughout Genesis 10, the rule is political sonship combined with a certain amount of genetic sonship. And Sidon and Heth were actually begotten sons of, uh, of Canaan. And uh, Sidon uh, does correspond to Poseidon of the uh, Hellenic tradition. Uh, because the second son of the Poseidon tradition is uh, named Hales, Hades, and that's cognate with Hate or Heth. 
Uh, those same two names appear uh, in the names of German tribes, uh, the Sidonis in the east of Ptolemy's uh, Germany, ancient Germany, and the Kati, or Hessians, in the west of Germany. Uh, now, the reason why the Germans remember them is that the Germans are an ancient people. They come from the Teutonic linguistic stock, and all ancient people remember, essentially, all of the Noahic elite. However, there's also a strong connection because uh, Canaan was Ham's uh, son, but the white matriarch, he himself was a yellow-red man, but he, had, he married the, the white matriarch, Uma, of the East Indian tradition, blonde. And uh, blondism uh, grew up through his progeny, and that started with Canaan and with Sidon. So uh, you talk about the Sidonians. Now, that's the Phoenician port of Sidon, and you get reinforcement there because the other famous port of, of, of Phoenicia is Tyre. Uh, a native pronunciation of Tyre is Sur, and that's an agreement with the East Indian sun god Surya, who's the son of Kanjapa, their version of Sidon. So uh, each one of these figures is fully and wholly international in scope. That is, if you, if you understand who they were. I mean, Canaan was a first-generation post-Diluvian and uh, the son of Ham. And his son, uh, Sidon, was, or Sidon, was uh, a second generation. Now, these people come so early that they're part of that pinnacle at the top. And so you expect to see them reflected in many, many traditions. The Hellenic is the Olympian gods, Poseidon and, ha and Hades, also in, reflected in the city, in Phoenician cities that I mentioned. The Bible is written from a very sober standpoint. Uh, Moses uh, was introducer of the law, and the law brought sin consciousness, and therefore great sobriety. And the myths of the Gentiles are, are often uh, poetically inflated. Sometimes they have distortions. In other words, in the, in the Akkadian epic, the Marduk epic, um, the Kingu, the enemy of Marduk, is slain, and mankind is created from his blood. Now, I don't believe that mankind was created from the blood of Kingu, but there's truth behind it. That is, the followers of the Kingu figure, Peleg, lost the war. They were dispersed over the face of the earth. And that's like the effusion of blood. So in other words, it's a metaphor that applies readily to what's there. So there's a vast amount of history in the mythologies of the, of the different nations, including the Greeks. They have supplied some very important things. In fact, they've supplied the most important thing about Sidon, Sidon, because they give Poseidon a family. And it, it turns out that the family they give him, is the family of Poseidon in Libya, as it's called, uh, accounts for all of the Javanite vassals in Genesis 10:4. So whenever you look at 10:4, connect that with Sidon because he was the physical ancestor of those persons who were uh, who, who became vassals of Javan. Hugh Hamrus discovered what he regarded, what he considered to be an inscription by Zeus and his father Kronos on the island of Crete, and those who identify the gods as human beings have followed uh, Hugh Hamrus' logic. I mean, they're called Hugh Hamrusts. I'm one of them, except that I also understand that the names of the gods uh, ultimately refer to our God under different names revealed in the, in the, New Test in the Old Testament. That is, uh, El Shaddai, Yahweh, Elohim, El Elyon, and uh, therefore there's a the theological, theocratic premise. But the, the link to Euhemerism is that these various uh, members of Noah's family became priests, high priests of these names of God. Uh, Melchizedek, for example, is a is a priest in the order of uh, uh, he, he's, he he worships God as El Elyon, not as Yahweh, not as Elohim, and so there is a priesthood factor that that dovetails with human deity. And human deity is not an outrage to God at all. You can see this in Psalm 82. I recommend everyone who's hearing this broadcast to look at Psalm 82 where El Elyon, the Most High God, addresses a variety of what are clearly human gods, little g gods. And this is taken so seriously by Christ that he discusses it and applies it to himself in, in uh, John chapter 10. Now, I believe in the deity of Christ, of course, but he's talking about being called a god when you're only a human being. Or you, uh, and and uh, this is supported by Psalm, uh, in Psalm 82 as interpreted by Christ. And so uh, your human God factor is basic to this science, very basic. Now, you people have this high longevity, and you are superior in that regard to the rest of the human race. Uh, but don't be, don't be very proud about all this, because you're going to die. And uh, it, it warns them on the basis that they might start uh, tyrannizing over the people 
that they had under the control, and boy, did they have them under the control. You, you, you ask how the pyramids were built? They were built by pharaohs who were god kings, and they were members of this elite community, simply reigning in Egypt. And they were god kings, and they had vast numbers of their, uh, of their descendants, uh, that is, persons of, of later generations, that they could treat uh, as, as slaves because they, 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 were, they were venerated as gods in their own time. And we have that on the record. That's on the record. So human deity was a major factor in early post diluvian times. Well, Zeus is a Zeus is a very important figure. I he's the first he's the third Olympian after Poseidon and Hades. I identify him as an inserted version of Shem, uh, who was a, uh, Shem was a universally recognized as a god of thunder and lightning. Uh, Ishkur of the Sumerians, Thor of the Teutons, um, uh, various other figures that are uh, that are storm gods, and you see a correlation between the storm god storm imagery and God Yahweh in uh, Genesis 18, excuse me, not Genesis 18, Psalm 18. So again, look at Psalm 18, where storm imagery is applied to Yahweh. And I learned at uh, Dallas Seminary that uh, language adopted there is taken directly, that language in that psalm is taken directly from the Ugaritic myths of Ali and Baal, who's a storm god of the city of Ugarit on the coast of Syria. And uh, the, in other words, he's a storm god, and the storm indexes Yahweh, and we know that Yahweh was the personal god of Shem because Noah made this statement, blessed be the Yahweh Elohim of Shem. Noah and his three sons could only be fairly diverse because they were his three sons. The actual uh, preservation of race in the ark was only entirely to the women. Well, mostly to the women. And the East Indians have a tradition they call the Mahadevi Tetra. That is, there are four female goddesses. The great goddess, and then Kali, the black one, Uma, the uh, fair-haired white one, and Durga, the yellow one, and by uh, process of elimination, identify the uh, uh, Mahadevi herself, the great goddess, uh, Noah's wife, as, a, uh, as an aquiline uh, Amerindian type. So they preserved the, the uh, races, uh, but then the languages had to be preserved by, in a different, somewhat different way, and both the males and females, all eight, were uh, carriers of language. You have to consider what was the lingua franca of the Ark. I, I'm inclined to believe it was Sumerian, because Sumerian arose so spontaneously and existed before the flood as well as after the flood in Mesopotamia. So I'm inclined to think, now that I wouldn't be dogmatic on that, but I think Sumerian was the common language of the Ark. But uh, Shem was a, character of in, a carrier of Indo-European, uh, Japheth of, of uh, Hamitic, uh, Egyptian, and so forth. So each had to be a carrier um, and racial diversity existed. Now, now Noah himself was in the line of Seth, and Seth was definitely the first Asian man. So in the male line, uh, Noah was an Asian type. Um, that is what used to be called a mongoloid type. Uh, however, uh, Shem and Japheth were his sons by the white matriarchs. They were Caucasoids, and very much so, comparatively speaking. So there was racial diversity in the ark, racial diversity in the ark, racial diversity.